We'll begin with an oral presentation on kernel instrumental variable regression by Rahul Singh. Great. Today I'm presenting kernel instrumental variable regression, which is joint work with Manish Sahani and Arthur Gretton of the UCL Gatsby unit. The motivation for this project is demand estimation. For many of us to attend Europe's, we took an airplane, which meant we bought an airline ticket at some airline ticket price. And we can imagine that an airline executive might have thought to herself, in the spirit of maximizing profit, that it would be great to estimate the demand curve, that is, the quantitative relationship between airline ticket sales and airline ticket prices, perhaps controlling for our customer characteristics and time of year. This executive might use a conventional kernel ridge regression, say, to fit that demand curve. And here's what happens. So on the vertical axis, we visualize loss. On the horizontal axis, we see training sample size, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. And we'll apply kernel ridge regression 40 times at each of these sample sizes. This is the demand design, by the way, from Hartford et al., 2017. And what we see is, that learning gets worse. As sample size increases, kernel root regression is performing more poorly. So what went wrong? What went wrong is unmeasured confounding. The goal of demand estimation and of this project more broadly is to learn a causal or counterfactual relationship H between some input X and output Y. A counterfactual relationship answers the question, if we intervened on X, what would be the effect on Y? In the presence of an unobserved confounder, prediction and counterfactual prediction are different learning problems. Formally, the conditional expectation of y given x does not equal h of x. And so any kind of non-parametric regression, kernel ridge regression included, will be a badly biased estimator of h. Let's visualize this phenomenon on the sigmoid design of Chen and Christensen 2018. It's a benchmark in econometrics. On the horizontal axis, we have x. On the vertical axis, y. h, the counterfactual relationship, is the smooth blue curve. We have access to observations, which are the gray dots, and you'll observe that they have a steeper slope than the counterfactual relationship because the presence of an unmeasured confounder that drives additional correlation in x and y. For this reason, applying kernel ridge regression, we see that it fits the data well, but it is biased away from the counterfactual relationship. Is there a way forward? And the answer is yes, by using instrumental variables. So recall what the setup was. In the presence of an unobserved confounder, prediction and counterfactual prediction are different learning problems. The goal is to nonetheless learn the counterfactual relationship between the input and the output. And now we'll appeal to a third variable, an instrumental variable z, that only influences the output via the input identifying the counterfactual relationship of interest. We'll formalize this by writing down the data, gener data generating process that y equals h of x plus e, where e is an unmeasured confounder. And we'll assume that the expectation of confounding given the instrument is zero. This is the assumption from Newey and Powell 2003. That was a bit abstract, so let's return to our demand estimation example. Remember the goal was to learn the demand curve, which was the causal or counterfactual relationship between airline ticket prices and airline ticket sales. So airline ticket prices are X and airline ticket sales are Y. Our observations of airline ticket prices and sales reflect not only demand as a market force, but other market forces as well, like supply. And so we'll use as our instrumental variable Z, gasoline prices, and here's the reasoning. Gasoline prices, directly affect airline ticket prices. Uh, they go into the supply costs of providing that airline ticket. Gasoline prices do not directly affect our demand for airline ticket sales. In fact, they only affect our demand for airline ticket sales via the channel of airline ticket price. So we're responding to changes in price. This was actually the original application of instrumental variables from Wright in 1928. Another example is imperfect compliance. So say we're interested in measuring the causal relationship between some treatment X and some health outcome Y. Perhaps we're able to randomly assign treatment. We'll call random, the random assignment Z. And by imperfect compliance, 
I mean that patients don't always do what they're told. Moreover, there could be unobserved confounding that affects this imperfect compliance. One story that's often the case is that perhaps a patient is assigned the treatment, but they're from a low-income household and they don't keep up with the treatment regime, so they don't actually end up taking the treatment. Another story is that perhaps a patient is not assigned the treatment, but they're from a high-income household, they leverage social capital and still end up taking the treatment. Can we still measure the effect, the causal relationship between treatment and the health outcome? The answer is yes, if we think about this as an instrumental variable setup. In fact, anytime we have a randomized action that can be ignored, um, that's only a recommendation or an advertisement, we're automatically in an instrumental variable setting. And we'll see how this is relevant for digital platforms in the next talk. So that was the instrumental variable framework. Now let's look at algorithms for actually estimating H. The most commonly used algorithm is called two-stage least squares. In stage one, perform the linear regression of inputs on instruments using N observations and use this to construct the conditional means, which I'll call X bar of Z. In stage two, perform the linear regression of outcomes on conditional means using the remaining M observations, and this will be our estimator for H. The major shortcoming of two-stage least squares is that it imposes linearity in the relationships among X, Y, and Z. Nonetheless, it's very widely used in economics. In the present work, we propose kernel instrumental variable regression, which is a non-parametric generalization of two-stage least squares. In stage one, perform the kernel ridge regression of features psi of X on instrument Z using N observations, and use this to construct the conditional mean embeddings. We'll call that mu of Z, and that's just the expectation of features of X given instruments Z. In stage two, perform the kernel ridge regression of outputs Y on conditional mean embeddings using the remaining M observations, and this will be our estimator for H. Importantly, kernel IV allows for nonlinear relationships among X, Y, and Z. In fact, it has a closed form solution, so it's easily implemented in just three lines of code. Next, we'd like to have some statistical guarantees for this algorithm. In our, in our analysis, we find out that asymmetric sample splitting is important. It's important that N and M are different. Uh, in particular, we'll find that it's important to calibrate that ratio, that optimal ratio between N and M to the relative smoothness of mu, that was the conditional mean embedding, and H, which was the counterfactual relationship. So for example, if mu is smooth, then N will be greater than M, it'll be M raised to some power greater than one, Whereas if uh, mu is quite rough, then n will be m raised to some power, again, greater than one, but actually bigger. In other words, as uh, mu becomes more rough, we need to assign more observations to that stage one estimation problem. The exact formula is given in the paper, and I'd like to point out that asymmetric sample splitting is actually a novel prescription in the instrumental variable literature. Using that sample splitting formula, we obtain this bound on the excess risk of kernel IV. It's the one we see on the right-hand side. B is the effective input dimension, and C is the smoothness of H. This rate is precisely the minimax optimal rate for single-stage regression from Caponetto and DeVito. In other words, kernel IV is learning with confounded data at the rate of learning with unconfounded data. Now let's see how it performs. So recall the sigmoid design. We had X on the horizontal axis, Y on the vertical axis. The counterfactual relationship was the blue curve. We see um, these uh, confounded observations, which are the gray dots. This is how kernel ridge regression performed. It fit the data well, but it was biased away from the counterfactual relationship of interest. And here's how kernel IV performs. Despite unmeasured confounding, it learns the counterfactual relationship. Now let's uh, measure these performances more quantitatively. We'll repeat that experiment 40 times and we'll increase sample size, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. So again, on the vertical axis is loss, on the horizontal axis, sample size, which will vary. This is how kernel ridge regression performs. This is how deep IV performs. That's a method proposed by Hartford et al. in 2017 that uses neural networks in both stage one and stage two. And here's how kernel IV performs. It performs especially well on smooth designs. 
Finally, let's return to that motivating example, the demand design. Remember, we were interested in the demand curve, that was the quantitative relationship between ticket prices and ticket sales, perhaps controlling for covariates. This was how kernel ridge regression performed uh, as sample size increases, learning got worse. This is how deep IV performs. And here's how kernel IV performs. So at sample size 1,000, kernel IV performs better than deep IV. At 5,000, they have similar performance. And at 10,000, deep IV performs better. For deep IV, we do not yet have statistical guarantees, but we hope that some of the techniques we de develop in this paper uh, could help build out that theory. So to conclude, our goal was to learn a causal or counterfactual relationship from confounded observational data. We propose kernel IV. Computationally, it's three lines of code because it's just two kernel ridge regressions. Statistically, it's minimax optimal. And in terms of performance, it performs best with a smooth design or when we have access to less than 10,000 observations. The success of kernel IV suggests that kernel methods could be an effective bridge between econometrics and machine learning. At this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. Okay, if anyone has questions, there are three mics. Uh, if no one has question, I can. Oh. I have a question. So, uh, in a linear case, uh, regression with instrumental variables has a geometric interpretation as an oblique projection. Right. Do you have a geometric intuition for this? Yeah, it's the exact same geometry. So, uh, we're doing all of our projections in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It still has inner product geometry, the same way that we use just Euclidean inner product geometry and two stage least squares. So it's precisely the same. Thank you. Uh, I have one question, maybe it's very naive, but uh, okay, we can, we can learn causal relationship from data, but how to validate it, uh, uh, like, if we don't have any domain knowledge, how to validate it on, only from the data? Um, so are you asking about tuning, like validation, or? Yeah, yes, I'm asking about validation. Ah, okay. Um, so the procedure we propose is to keep in mind that there's sample splitting. So on stage one, you're using your stage one observations, and that's just a regression. And so you can validate the tuning parameter for that on the stage two kind of held out observations. And then in stage two, we are plugging in our stage one estimator, but it's a regression using these, uh, these observations and we can kind of then tune that on the, the held out observations from stage one. So that's the, uh, that's the approach we use in practice. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Uh, oops. Hi. So uh, naively, I would think that uh, you could do, you should be able to do as well with uh, using neural networks as kernels. So, do you think the re the reason that uh, kernel IV is doing better is because of like sample complexity, like maybe it needs much more to fit for neural nets, or do you have some other explanation? Yeah. So, in the uh, Hartford et al. 2017 deep IV approach, in stage one, they're fitting these mixture neural networks. And then for stage two, it's sampling from that kind of fitted distribution uh, estimation problem, which is very demanding of data. And so when the actual underlying truth is smooth or you have fewer observations, uh, that's just not enough for how hungry the neural networks are. Thanks. I just quick question about the uh, general case of multivariate case with maybe potential confounders, latent confounders. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so, so far, I presented where X was uh, our input of interest, Z was the instrument. Say that we had additional covariates, I'll call them W, uh, which are our consumer characteristics and time of year and things like this. In that case, everything goes through. We'll just use as our inputs the concatenation of X and W, and we'll use as our instruments the concatenation of Z and W. Uh, so everything goes through. It actually handles that case as well. We will move on to the spotlight presentations. So, in uh, collaboration with TripAdvisor, we wanted to address the following problem. 
What is the causal effect of becoming a member on TripAdvisor on downstream activity on the web page? And how does that effect vary with observa ob observable characteristics of the user? Knowing the answer to these questions is useful for understanding the quality of the membership offering, improving the membership offering, and targeting the right user segment. The standard approach to address these questions would be to run an A-B test. But A-B testing is not feasible in this scenario because we can not simply enforce the treatment. We cannot take a random half of the users and make them members. Membership is an action that requires user engagement. This is a typical problem whenever optimizing a web service, we want to understand causal effects of actions that involve user engagement. Even though we cannot run A-B tests, we can actually run recommendation A-B tests. We can recommend or create extra incentives to half of the users to take the action or the treatment. For example, on TripAdvisor, we can enable an easier sign-up flow process for a random half of the users. However, the fact that users choose to comply or not with the recommendation can lead to biased estimates if traditional A-B testing, uh, A -B testing methodologies are used. And here is where instrumental variables come in handy. An instrumental variable is any variable that affects the treatment assignment but does not affect the outcome other than through the treatment. In the case of a recommendation A-B test, the cohort assignment is an instrument. So we can apply IV methods to estimate the treatment effect. However, typical IV methods do not account for complex effect or compliance heterogeneity. Moreover, in this work, we're particularly interested in estimating personalized or heterogeneous treatment effects. So how does uh, the treatment effect vary as a function of observable characteristics? So the two main questions that we ask is, can we learn complex nonlinear models for the heterogeneous effect? And can we reduce the estimation to standard machine learning problems like regression and classification? Here is an outline of how the solution looks like for the uh, case of a recommendation A-B test. You don't need to look through the exact, exact uh, details. But what's important is that each of these steps is just a classification or a regression problem. So we can use arbitrary machine learning methods to uh, solve these sub-problems. The benefits of such a reduction approach is that we can leverage the statistical and computational benefits of modern machine learning methods. We can perform cross-validation for model selection and hyperparameter tuning, even for our final causal model. And we can interpret our causal model using out-of-the-box interpretability methods uh, in machine learning, such as SAP, LIME, or influence functions. Moreover, we saw that the loss function that uh, uh, we use in our final estimation step satisfies the property of Neiman orthogonality. And using this, we can show that the mean squared error of our final causal model is robust to errors in the auxiliary classification and regression uh, uh, models that we needed to fit. This result extends beyond the recommendation A-B test setting to any linear in treatment IV setting and resolves an open question in the literature on the existence of such orthogonal losses for IV setups. Moreover, when the final regression, that, uh, the, the regression method that we use supports confidence interval construction, typically Neiman orthogonality preserves the validity, the validity of those intervals. So we can perform inference on the best linear projection of the heterogeneous effect, or even inference in high dimensional linear projections using the Debias lasso, or even non parametric inference via honest regression forests. Going back to the TripAdvisor problem, TripAdvisor deployed a recommendation A-B test where if for a random half of 4 million users, an easier sign-up flow was enabled. And then we measured the number of visits in the next 14 days. The high-level takeaways of our estimation uh, of, of, of the models that we estimated was that there was large heterogeneity based on which pages were recently visited and on, based on the platform of access. These results enable better targeting of the right user population and improvements of membership offering for user segments for which there is small or almost zero effects. You can try out our methods. They are available in open source as, part, as a prototype in the EconML library, and they will soon be integrated uh, through the uh, EconML library. Uh, and so you can visit the webpage and visit our poster for further questions. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Amin Jaber and I'll be presenting our work titled Identification of Conditional Causal Effects Under Markov Equivalence. So to start with a motivating example, uh, let's say we're interested in the causal effect of exercise on cholesterol level and for that purpose we uh, collect some data measuring exercise in hours, cholesterol level and the age of each person. And then we plot this data. 
So with that, uh, while ignoring age, we observe that there is, in the, left fig uh, in the left figure, that there is a positive correlation between exercise and cholesterol. However, uh, by, by incorporating age, by representing age with a different color for each age category, then we observe in the right figure that there is a negative correlation between exercise and cholesterol per each age group. Uh, now, which observation, the question is, which observation corresponds to the causal effect of exercise on cholesterol? From the causal inference field, we know that this answer cannot be, this question cannot be answered uh, except by knowing the data generating model or the, the causal diagram. So for this story, if this is our diagram, then we can see that the observation in the left diagram does not actually correspond to the causal effect because it also accounts for this spurious relation between exercise and cholesterol going through age. However, once we condition on age, then we are basically blocking this backdoor path or spurious relation and we are left with the causal component. So the more general question here is, under what graphical conditions can we, uh, can we provide this mapping from the observational data to the experimental or, uh, or uh, causal distribution? This is more formally known as the problem of, of causal identification. So in this case, we are given a causal query, which reads as the distribution of Y conditioned on Z. While we intervene on X, intervention is basically fixing the values of the variables in X to a specific value. We also have the causal diagram, where a bidirected dashed edge corresponds to an unmeasured confounder. And we have the, ob the observational data. With this input, uh, the, the research question is, based on the current knowledge about the diagram encoded in, uh, about the problem encoded in the diagram, uh, and the available data, uh, is the research question identifiable or not? And by identifiable, we mean is it uniquely computable from the observational data or not? So the state-of-the-art methods comprise this causal inference engine, which uh, answers this question. And whenever the answer is yes, then we are given this expression, which provides the mapping from the association to the causation. This is great. However, this engine is contin contingent to the presence of uh, of the causal diagram, which usually is not possible to obtain. Now, the obvious question is, can we learn the causal diagram from the available data? And in general, the answer is unfortunately no. So to witness, consider the following three different diagrams. Now, those diagrams, they, in, they impose uh, the same constraints over the observational distribution in terms of conditional independences and are said to be in the same Markov equivalence class. Now, obviously, given just the data, we are unable to pin down one specific diagram that is generating this data. However, what we can learn is a summary graph that uh, encodes the, the invariant graphical properties of all the diagrams that are in this, in this Markov equivalence class. Now, by learning the, an equivalence class instead of a single diagram from the available data, the new problem becomes, based on the qualitative causal diagram, learned from the data, is the causal effect computable or not? And in our work, we were interested in characterizing this relaxed causal inference, uh, causal inference engine, which whenever it answers yes, then we are given an expression and we expect that the effect is identifiable, meaning computable in every diagram in the equivalence class and with the same expression, which corresponds to the same effect as well. Now, in conclusion, uh, we develop an algorithm to identify conditional causal effects from an equivalence class of causal diagrams. Uh, this is the first general and entirely data-driven uh, procedure for finding conditional causal effects uh, that is available in the literature. And finally, uh, to know more about, uh, about our work, please stop by our poster. And thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to introduce our paper, Likelihood Free Overcomplete ICA and Applications in Color Discovery. This is a joint work with Ming Ming Gong from Melbourne U, Quinn Zhang from CMU, and Da Chun Tang from Sydney U. Um, color discovery is an important topic in various disciplines, such as uh, economy, geography, and biology. Previous Approaches on color discovery can be categorized into three types. 
The first is constraint-based methods such as PC and FCI. The second is score-based methods such as GES. The third is functional color models uh, such as Lingam. Uh, the most important part in Lingam is ICA. An ICA model can, uh, is comprised of three parts, mixtures, mixing metrics, and independent components, or ICs in short. Uh, when the dimension of ICs is larger than that of mixtures, we call it overcomplete ICA or OICA. Some color discovery problems, such as color discovery from measurement error and uh, color discovery from missing common causes, can be regarded as an extension of OICA. Most of the solutions for OICA are maximum likelihood learning based. First, they assume parametric distribution for the ICs, for example, mix of Gaussian, then derive the likelihood for the observed data. There are two drawbacks of this kind of approach. The first is uh, flexible parametric distribution, such as mix of Gaussian, pose significant computational challenge. The second is, um, it is uh, very restrictive for many real-world applications. To tackle this kind of problems, um, we propose likelihood-free um, OIC, OLF OIC in short, which does not need explicit assumptions on the density functions of ICs, uh, and it is computational efficient. To see the framework of LF OICA, let's see this figure. Assume we have four ICs and three uh, mixtures. First, like GAM, we sample independently from some easy distributions, such as Gaussian. Um, then, for each IC, we initialize a separate MLP. Taking the samples from previous step um, as input into the MLP, we generate corresponding IC. Next, we initialize a mixing matrix, mix the generated ICs, and generate the mixtures. Then we calculate the MMD between the distribution of the true mixtures and the distribution of generated mixtures. Finally, we minimize the MMD by updating the mixing matrix and the parameters in MLPs iteratively. We apply this framework in uh, two, two, uh, in two color discovery problems. The first is color discovery from measurement error. We model the data without measurement error using x tilde here in the first equation. Then we add measurement error to the color, to the above color model, in, which leads to the second equation. As we can see, the color model with measurement error can be regarded as an OICA model, and LF OICA can be applied. Um, the second one is color discovery from subsample time series. Um, due to time limit, I won't go into too much details about this. What I want to see is, again, uh, the model for subsampled time series data can be seen as an extension of OICA. So LF OICA can be applied. Uh, that's it. For more information, welcome to our poster today. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, you. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Christoph Meeting, and I present our work about human and algorithmic perception of the error of time. It is important to understand the principles of causal inference employed by the human visual system. Imagine that you're walking through nature and you're looking at a bush full of leaves. Are objects moving or standing still? Or are the movements caused by other actors, for example, a predator behind the leaves? However, in cognitive science, causal inference is also a controversial topic. It is unclear how to best measure the causal abilities of humans. Thus, we focus in our work on one of the most natural ways to define the causal flow. The past influences the future, but not reverse. This is the error of time. Clearly, humans can perceive the error of time if there is a clear direction in the data. For example, if we observe an explosion. 
Parallel to the research in cognitive science, researchers in machine learning also have developed algorithms to gain causal knowledge from data alone. One class of recent machine learning algorithms exploits the dependent structure of additive noise terms for inferring the error of time. This raises the question whether the subtle asymmetries between the time directions can also be perceived by human observers. This is what we investigate in our work. We investigated the abilities of human observers to detect the error of time and compared the human abilities to algorithmic abilities. We constructed a psychophysical experiment in which human observers watched a jiggling moving dot. This dot was following an autoregressive time series model with non-Gaussian noise, either bimodal noise or super-Gaussian noise. In two conditions, either it, plays, it was played in the forward direction or in the backward direction. For non-Gaussian additive noise in an autoregressive time series model, the noise is independent in the forward direction but depend in the backward direction. That is what the algorithms exploit. And now the question is, can humans see this difference? Unfortunately, the video does not work of the stimuli, but observers watched these uh, jiggling moving dots in the experiment and then pressed a button if they think it belongs to the forward or to the backward ca uh, category. Oh, no. We compared our human subjects to different algorithms an ideal as well as a suboptimal Bayesian observer, a neural network, and a recent causal inference algorithm for machine learning. Additionally, we developed a rather simple heuristic based on our introspection as well as carefully eliciting feedback from our observers. Finally, we employed a so-called for the noise paradigm originally invented in auditory psychophysics. The for the noise paradigm enables us to see if two behaving agents humans to each other, but also humans to algorithms, and algorithms to each other, if they use the same strategy. This is a very simple and easy to implement analysis, and we believe that a lot of people in the audience could actually use this paradigm in their data analysis. So what did we find? Human observers are surprisingly good in classifying our time events, even very difficult ones. Our results suggest that all human observers use a similar strategy to solve the task, but the human algorithm is unique and significantly different from the three machine learning algorithms we compared it to. Especially our human observers appear not to use a similar strategy as our ideal and suboptimal Bayesian observer. In fact, our simple heuristic appears most similar to our human observers. This simple heuristic only needs a few lines of code and also works on real data from EEG recordings. So to summarize, we use a powerful, easy to implement method enabling us to find whether humans and algorithms process information similarly. We find that humans are sensitive to subtle temporal asymmetries and they appear to use the same information or strategy. We show that humans do not use a recent causal inference algorithm or Bayesian ideal observer. Instead, their behavior is well approximated by four-line code of heuristic. If you, want to more, if you want to find out more about causal inference abilities of human observers, please come tomorrow morning to my poster. Yes, this is my talk. Um, good, good morning, everyone. My, my name is Alexis. And um, in the next few minutes, I'd like to introduce you to the problem of uh, condition independence testing and also give you an overview of our new approach to encourage you to come to our poster. Um, so I hope you, you guys all went to uh, the excellent tutorial yesterday on two sample testing, among other things, by Arthur Gretting and colleagues. And I'd like to stress again the importance of that kind of research. So hypothesis testing in general has um, brought a massive advancement to our understanding of science and can, can be taken as one of the best examples of what we mean by evidence-based reasoning. So uh, this kind of stuff really has applications uh, everywhere. So let's briefly take the, um, the setup they considered into sample testing and try to find relationships with our problem of independent uh, testing. So take uh, two samples of data independently drawn from uh, two distributions. 
So to sample problem, ask whether we can determine if uh, these two distributions are equal or not. Now, the relationship with independence testing is uh, not immediately obvious, but can be established by considering a third random variable, which is a binary label, say, and each um, sample from uh, P and Q will be assigned to a label of 0, 1, depending if um, this was uh, drawn from the first population or the second population. Then this two-sample problem is equivalent to testing for independence between our observed data and this binary label. And uh, if true, then uh, the data is irrelevant for predicting this binary label. Now, with this um, analogy, the conditional independence problem um, accounts for an additional context, so conditions on a third uh, random variable z, and uh, as for independence in that context of x and y. So an example will make uh, matters concrete. So consider a, um, a researcher trying to develop a drug for a particular gene with, uh, with the objective of uh, reducing mortality for a given disease. Now, we've seen in previous talks that uh, it's not because two variables are related that necessarily there's a direct link between them. For example, you could have a common cause to two variables that uh, accounts for uh, the observed uh, correlation that we see. Now, this is the asking for the question if there is a link between the gene of interest and the disease is exactly a conditional independence uh, question. Um, these kind of formalism uh, questions feel also in, um, in a lot of other uh, applications. For example, what data should I collect or uh, causal inference more generally to learn uh, Bayesian networks. It also appears an important concept in statistics and also has applications to in uh, fairness. And so just a couple of examples for, for you to see. Now, our approach is intuitively fairly simple, actually. So if a condition independence holds, then we have this relationship between uh, two conditional uh, distributions. Now, assume we had access to the distribution of uh, PY given Z. Now, and imagine we constructed uh, a large number of data sets where our observed Y variable is replaced by this synthetically generated um, variable from this uh, distribution. Then um, if um, then these uh, additional data sets that we created will break the dependency between uh, X and Y. And under the assumption of conditional independence, you shouldn't see any, any difference between the observed dependency and the synthetically generated dependencies. So our algorithm ex exploits um, this fact. So the main contribution of, of our work is in showing that um, with uh, an estimated uh, conditional distribution, P, Y of Z, this uh, setup still, still holds. So we're able to, and, and what we did is um, we developed a, a new GAN to estimate this distribution and encourage a uh, high power. And we showed that um, it gave us uh, valid testing, but with a completely different set of assumptions that has been uh, considered before. So we don't make any assumptions on uh, the data distribution, really. Um, we're able to have guarantees with a finite sample instead of asymptotic samples, which is uh, much more common. And uh, in experiments, we, we found this approach because of the flexibility of neural networks to perform well in, in high dimensions. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, please join us, our professor. Thanks everyone for coming with this we conclude our uh, this session thank you